Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So in this video, I'm gonna walk through the game theory practice exercises and I'll have separate videos for the other ones. Okay, so the first one, consider the following game. Uh, we have column player choosing high or low, row player choosing high or low. The first payoff goes to row player, the second payoff goes to column player. We wanna find all the pure Nash equilibrium. We wanna identify this as a prisoner's dilemma or not. Okay, so to be able to find Nash equilibrium, what we want to do is we want to look for best responses. We'll underline the best response to the rival's choice. So if the column player chooses high, what does the row player want to do? Well, they could do high and get three, or they can do low and get five, so we'll underline five. If column player chooses low, what does row player want to do? Well, the best response to low is low, because one is bigger than zero. Notice I'm only paying attention to row players' payoffs. I'm ignoring column players' payoffs for the purposes of finding rows' best response. What about row player? Uh, what about column player's choice? When row player chooses high, column player can get five from choosing low because five is bigger than three. And so we'll underline five. Or if row player chooses low, column player chooses low because one is bigger than zero. Since we have two underlines in this column and since we have two underlines in this row, we have both players with a dominant strategy to choose low. Not all Nash equilibrium involve dominant strategies. However, if one does, or if, if a player has a dominant strategy, it must be part of any Nash equilibrium. And so here we have our Nash equilibrium is low, low. They each get a payoff of one. It actually meets the criteria of a, of a prisoner's dilemma. Both have a dominant strategy, yeah? And then they're jointly better off if they both simultaneously use their non-dominant strategy. So we can see that by summing up payoffs. So one plus one is two. So, so social surplus is two here, three plus three is six. Social surplus is maximized when they both use high. Not here because five and zero is five. However, those social surplus is maximized if they use their non-dominant strategy. Clearly, like if you think your co-player is gonna do high, you for sure wanna do low because you'd rather have the five than jointly have six, right? Okay, consider the following game, find all pure strategy Nash equilibrium. Is this a prisoner's dilemma? Yeah, it's not a prisoner's dilemma. <laughs> right? Uh, find all peer strategy Nash equilibrium. So row players choosing capital A or capital B, column players choosing little a or little b. Uh, let's find row's best response to column's choice of little a. Well, two is bigger than zero, so we'll underline the two. What about row's best response to column's choice of b? Well, we'll underline both zero and zero because we get the same either way. What about column player's best response to row's choice of a? Uh, it should be little a because two is bigger than zero when column chooses B. What if row player chooses big B? What's column player's best response? Well, A and B are the same. We'll just underline zero and zero. Okay, so we have two Nash equilibrium. Nobody has, uh, nobody has a dominant, uh, nobody has a dominant strategy. There's not one, there's not one strategy that's always the best response. We have two Nash equilibria though, A, A, and then B, B. Here's a coordination game because of the two Nash equilibrium. Actually, there's, so we have three Nash equilibrium, two in pure strategies, but there's a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium that lies somewhere between these. So you could find it, uh, but I didn't ask us to do that here. For a prisoner's dilemma, re requires both to have a dominant strategy and then joint payoffs maximize when they both play their non-dominant strategy. That's what I mentioned above. So, All right, consider the two following games in normal form. So. This is the Bach and Stravinsky, or the Battle in this, of the Sexes game. So it's a famous, uh, famous economics game. So game one is BB, and then FF, it's a coordination game, obviously. There's, uh, and then game two, we add this outside option of video. So this, the setup for the game is like, you have two players, they're trying to coordinate without communication, whether they go to uh, BB or FF, it's like, I don't know, boxing or football or ballet or whatever. So. Uh, and then V is if one stays home and watches a video, good. So it's just an outside option. If we're analyzing these in the first one, no one has a, has a dominated strategy or a dominant strategy. However, row player has a dominated strategy in game two. If you're staring at this, think about row player's payoffs. It's three or zero if playing B, it's two or two if playing V or V. Well, both three and two are bigger than zero, but two is bigger than one. And so uh, definitely V is a, dom a dominant strategy over F, V dominates F, and certainly some mixture of B and V dominates F. So row player's never gonna play F because V or some combination of B and V is gonna dominate F. So F is never a best response. There's a mixture over BV or just 
V, that rho prefers to F or that dominates F. Now let's find all Nash equilibrium in peer and mixed strategies. Well, in mixed or peer strategies, we'll find, so suppose rho player chooses B, what does column player want to do? B because three is bigger than zero. What if row player, what if column player chooses F, what does row player want to do? F because one is bigger than zero. What if row player chooses B, what does column player want to do? B because one is bigger than the zero. Or if row player chooses F, what does column player want to do? F because that three is bigger than zero. So there's our two peer strategy. You can probably see that by staring at it. Now let's find the mixed strategy. So row player is going to choose their mixture over B and F so as to keep column player indifferent between their cho their choices of B and F. Remember, the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium involves finding the probabilities over the distribution of a player's strategy so as to keep their rival indifferent. So this is going to this arrow right here is showing that I'm indicating when column player selects B. Well, what's column player selects B when the payoffs from B are bigger than the payoffs from F. What are the payoffs from B? Well, it's going to be 1 with probability P plus zero with probability one minus P, so that's this. What's the payoff from F? Zero with probability P, three with probability one minus P. Okay, and then solving, we find that column is gonna, is gonna be indifferent between B and F if row player plays B exactly three-fourths of the time, and column player is definitely gonna choose B if row player uses big B more than three-fourths of the time. Right, so look at the payoff that column player is getting, this one versus this three. If row player is playing B more than three-fourths of the time, this one becomes increasingly enticing. Right? That's what's necessary to pull column player away from trying to get this three here. Row player is gonna choose Q, or choose their strategy, their distribution to keep, column player is gonna choose Q, their, their probability with which they play B, to keep row indifferent between row strategies. Row uses big B, when the payoffs from choosing big B are bigger than the payoffs from choosing F. So what are the payoffs from big B? What's this three times Q plus zero times one minus Q? What are the payoffs from F? Zero with probability Q and one with probability one minus Q. So that's this right here. And this boils down to, well, row player is gonna be indifferent between B and F if column player plays little b with probability one fourth. And row player is gonna strictly prefer B if column player plays B, little b with more probability of greater than one fourth. All right, so this gives rise to the following mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. P is the probability waiting on big B for row player. So three fourths, one fourth is the mixture that row player has over their strategies. One fourth, three fourths is the mixture that column player has over their strategies so as to keep each other indifferent. My comment here, P uh, greater than three fourths since column only gets one from uh, BB and three from uh, FF, uh, row must do B at least three fourths of the time. And this is what's necessary to, to pull, uh, to, to reinforce this right here. Row must play uh, B at least three fourths of the time to keep column player indifferent between this three here and this three here. That's what this extra note's saying. All right, so in game two, find our mixed, our pure mixed strategy. So pure strategy are going to be uh, BB and VF. Why? Well, suppose column player chooses little b, what does row player want to do? Big B, because three is bigger than zero and two. If, row, if column player chooses F, what does row player want to do? V, because two is bigger than one and zero. If row player chooses one, what does column player want to do? B, because one is bigger than zero. If row player were to choose F, what does column player want to do? Uh, F, because three is bigger than zero. If row player does V, what does column player want to do? Well, we'll underline both because they're indifferent between B and F. All right, row is going to choose P. This is going to be their mixture over B and V to keep column indifferent between B and F. Notice I've eliminated, I put probability zero on F because F is dominated by V and by some combination of, and certainly by some combination of B and V. So we're not going to have any mixture that involves F for row player. All right, so column player is gonna choose B when their payoff from choosing B exceeds their payoff from choosing F. What is the payoff from B? It's gonna be one with probability P plus two with probability one minus P, that's this. What's their payoff from F? Zero with probability P plus two with probability one minus P, that's this. We ignore this three, why? Because it's happening with probability zero, as is this zero. Uh, what ends up happening here? Well, if you solve, look, we get P greater than or equal to zero. You're like, 
what's this? Well, what this is telling us is any likelihood, any weighting on B makes little b better for column player than F. Stare at that for a second. Well, column player could, by choosing B, is going to get either 2 or 1. By choosing F is either going to get 2 or 0. When is 2 or 1 bigger, better than 2 or 0? Well, when there's any probability, when Q is any, when uh, there's any probability, sorry, not Q, when P is, uh, is anything bigger than 0. So that there's any, any chance of getting this 1 rather than getting this uh, the 0 there. All right, column is going to choose Q to keep row indifferent between B and V. So row players' payoffs are going to be 3 with probability Q plus 0 with probability 1 minus Q. And then, uh, let's see, V with prob 2 with probability Q and 2 with probability 1 minus Q. And so this ends up being... Uh, so this ends up being rows, rows uh, mixing between B and V. Row selects B outright if Q is bigger than two-thirds. Column selects B whenever P is bigger than zero, whenever column believes row places any weight on B. Right. Okay, so again, we ignored F. Why? Well, column is choosing Q to keep row indifferent between B, F, and V. Row is not indifferent between B and F or V and F. Right? Rho strictly prefers V to F and then some mixture of B and V over F. So I'm just going to eliminate F. That's why they didn't appear down here. Column doesn't have to take any action to make a row not want to take, not want to play F. Rho is just not going to play F. Yeah. Okay. So that's what this is. That's what this is doing here. Uh, what effect does the additional strategy, uh, Rho strategy V, have on the game? Well, the additional strategy. This is an outside option, uh, and so what ends up happening is this is helping coordination on this BB outcome. Why? Well, because B weakly dominates V. Uh, sorry, like the outcome from B is uh, is weakly preferred to the outcome from playing uh, playing, uh, uh, playing playing V for um, for the uh, for the column player. Okay, so consider the following situation. This has been modeled as a normal form game. So we have two players, row and column. Find all Nash equilibrium and pure strategies for positive X. And then assume x is three. Solve for all Nash equilibrium and mere in mixed strategies. Okay, so if this is neg, if x is positive, then this thing is increasingly small, right below zero. So finding uh, Nash equilibrium and pure strategies. Well, there aren't any. Why? So like, if column player were to choose L, what does row player want to do? Down. If column player were to choose right, what does row player want to do? One. So we've underlined this one. We've underlined that one. If row player chooses up, what does column player want to do? Well, if this is small like below zero then row column player is going to choose zero if row player chooses one what does column player want to do this one so we've underlined this here this here this here and this here so there's no nash equilibrium and pure strategies what about mixed strategies well row is going to mix between their own strategies to keep column indifferent columns payoff from choosing left is going to be zero with probability p and and zero with probability one minus p. Columns payoffs from choosing right is going to be minus three with probability p and one with probability one minus p, right? We're switching zero or x with three. So what this tells us is that column is indifferent between left and right when row plays up with probability one fourth and column strictly prefers left when row plays, uh, when row plays, um, Wait, yeah, this one, and then when when p is bigger than uh, than one fourth, then that gets row uh, that gets row to play uh, left. Why they're trying to avoid that minus three? Okay, so column mixes between column strategies to keep row indifferent. So these are rows payoffs. This is going to be zero with probability q plus one with probability one minus q. This is going to be one with probability q, and then zero with probability one minus q. And so we find that this, when, when um, rho chooses up, when q is less than or equal to uh, less than or equal to one half. So anyway, so our mixed Nash equilibrium, which keeps the rivals indifferent, is when rho plays up with a quarter probability, three fourths down, and column plays left and right equally likely. Okay, and then so our. Uh, so our extensive form game. Recently, McDonald's has expanded into the specialty coffee market with its McCafe brand. Markets traditionally dominated by firms such as Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts. We can model this as a particular this 
entry as a sequential game. Starbucks is the incumbent. At the initial node, McDonald's has the choice between in and out, followed by Starbucks choosing price war or acquiesce. If McDonald's chooses to stay out, the game ends. Starbucks is happy. If McDonald's enters the market, Starbucks selects acquiesce. The two firms share the market. Finally, if McDonald's enters and Starbucks chooses price war, we get an outcome where Starbucks fights aggressively and dissipates profits through the price war. Here's the extensive form game representation. We want to find the backward induction solution. This will, in this game, be the unique subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. So here is our McCafe entry game. We have McDonald's choosing in or out, Starbucks choosing acquiesce or price war. The first payoffs go to McDonald's. The second payoff goes to Starbucks. So when McDonald's chooses out, they get a payoff of one for sure, and Starbucks get a payoff of three. When McDonald's goes in and Starbucks uses price war, they both get zero. When McDonald's chooses in and Starbucks chooses acquiesce, they both get two. All right, so solving the game by backward induction, we go to the end of the game I've already highlighted. We see if Starbucks is called upon to play, two is bigger than zero, so Starbucks will acquiesce. If we can figure this out, presumably McDonald's can figure it out, and so McDonald's looking forward is going to compare this two to that one and say, oh, we'd rather have two. So we're going to go in knowing that Starbucks is then going to acquiesce. And so the payoffs are going to be two, two. So the unique uh, subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, which is requiring Nash equilibrium play in all subgames, I'll let it demonstrate that here, which is also the backward induction solution is in and acquiesce. There's another degenerate Nash equilibrium involving out and price war, although that is not sequentially rational because once Starbucks is called upon to play, they are definitely gonna acquiesce. All right, write down the game in normal form representation. Might find it useful to do so in a payoff matrix. So here is the representation. How did I do this? Well, what I like doing is I first take the payoffs that are obvious, and so this is gonna be out, uh, sorry, this is gonna be in acquiesce and in price war. Okay, so in price war, in acquiesce, and then I need to fill out the rest of the table, so it's gonna be this one three, right? Because the payoffs are, when McDonald's chooses out, are gonna be one three regardless of what Starbucks does. All right, find all Nash equilibrium in the game, peer and mixed strategies. Well, finding peer strategy Nash equilibrium, I did this here underlining. So if, if Starbucks chooses price war, what does McDonald's wanna do? They wanna go out because one is bigger than zero. Starbucks chooses acquiesce. What does McDonald's want to do? They want to go in because two is bigger than one. If McDonald's chooses in. What does Starbucks want to do? Acquiesce because two is bigger than zero. That's this two. If McDonald's chooses out, what does Starbucks want to do? Well, it will underline both three and three. So those are our two mixed, our two Nash equilibrium in pure strategies, out P and then in A. There's one in mixed strategies. So the mixture, is let's see um, Starbucks is choosing price war with probability Q and acquiesce with probability one minus Q the payoffs to that and then solving how this would work the payoffs to McDonald's to keep McDonald's indifferent would be uh, zero with probability Q and two with probability one minus Q versus out with prob or one with probability Q and one with probability one minus Q and if you solve you'll find that there is a mixed strategy for any Q bigger than one half. If Q is less than one half, then row player is gonna use in to get two after column selects A. However, if Q is bigger than one half, then, um, then we've got this mixture between, let's see, so out and then uh, and this mixture holds. Uh, Starbucks, yeah, Starbucks just has to pay, play, uh, place more weight on price war and McDonald's stays out for sure. And this is one half keeps them exactly indifferent. And that's driven by these payoffs. Okay, so are the Nash equilibrium reasonable? Should McDonald's stay out of the market? Well, what this is saying is that the out P, uh, out price war equilibrium is less appealing because it's not sequentially rational. It's resting, price war is not a credible threat. Upon realizing the course of events that unfolded brings Starbucks to the point in time that they're called upon to decide Starbucks no longer benefits by continuing to play out P. At this point, Starbucks is better off choosing acquiesce. Okay, I'm already bored of that. <laughs> It's basically, there's not a credible commitment. So uh, we don't like the Nash equilibrium. That is not our backward induction solution. Okay, so consider the following game in extensive form. Find any pure strategy Nash equilibrium using backward induction. So backward induction goes to the end of the game. I'm going to go to the back of the game. and I'm going to say, okay, Anne's, pay oh, Anne's payoffs are the first one, Anne's player one. So the five and eight go to Anne. The four goes to Anne. The nine goes to Anne. The one goes to Bob. The four goes to Bob. The one goes to Anne. 
and the five goes, sorry, Bob, and then the five goes to Bob. Okay, so when Anne chooses at Anne's decision node, Anne can get a payoff of five or Anne can get a payoff of eight. Eight is better, so Anne will choose steel. So I've highlighted steel. At Bob's decision node, Bob is gonna look forward and say Anne is going to steal, so I will get a payoff of one, or I could do don't and I get a payoff of four. So I will highlight Bob's choice of don't. Now Anne looking forward is gonna say, okay, well, if I share, Bob is definitely going to use don't, so I will get a payoff of four. Anne's not even gonna consider, although realizes like if Bob were to trust, it's not gonna happen, but suppose Bob did trust, yeah, then I could get this eight. However, um, Anne's gonna expect that Bob is going to not share, and so Anne is gonna choose grab and get this nine. And so our Nash equilibrium is gonna be grab, steal, capturing the strategy that Anne is using here and the strategy Anne uses here, and then uh, don't is Bob's choice. So the backward induction solution, grab, steal, don't. And uh, let's see, oh, so I should have used, uh, I should have used Bob and I should have used Anne here, sorry. So, um, okay. Anyway, so, uh, so, so Bob ends up choosing don't because uh, four is bigger than one, that's the logic I gave us here, and chooses grab because four is, or nine is bigger than four. So backward induction solution is grab steal and then don't. Uh, why did I use grab steal? Well, rest on the fact that a strategy is a complete contingent plan. So Anne actually has to tell us what Anne's gonna do if Anne's called upon to play at Anne's later decision node, right? And so even though Anne's own choice is going to prevent this one from being reached and Anne's belief about Bob's choice is going to keep this from being reached, Anne's strategy has to give us Anne's own choice, even though Anne's choice here precludes this from happening because we need the strategy to be a complete contingent plan. It's going to tell us what a player would do at every point in, their, in, in the game. Uh, that gets a little bit beyond what we care about for intermediate micro. Uh, it's more of like uh, the advanced game theory class, but I wanted to at least lay that foundation here. And since I don't, I don't think it, I think it, I think the the educational value sort of outweighs maybe like a minimal amount of uh, confusion there. So hopefully I'm right. <laughs> All right, hope you enjoyed. I'm going to make another video for this asymmetric information one.